can do it. You can do it. I don't know. Last week, I literally was like, how? How did you mess this up so bad? Whatever. Okay. Live on Facebook. Here comes the fancy window. Here comes Alan. Great. Bum, 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 bum. Welcome. Welcome. Everyone is coming. It's been a couple of hours since I dipped in to the Canvas class, but Alan, you get gold stars because you did your homework and you posted your answers into Canvas. It's not required, but I'm just showing off that if there is a brown noser today, roll taken. Congratulations. I know that's a very important thing for people. Um, I've also gotten a number of emails from folks who are saying that, uh, um, like, you know, work is taking over, they can't keep up with the reading, things are really busy, I'm so sorry. And um, I think it's important to mention that this is challenge by choice. And you can read at your own pace at any time. And it is not required, you can do anything you want to. So if you skip one or miss one or come back or invited somebody and they're not here, number one, I don't care. And number two, it's completely fine. Um, I have opened live stream onto Facebook. I have made it public. I know it's very exciting. Okay, so now let's see if I can type something that makes sense. Module three, is this three? Three, great. Uh, here we go. Join us. Good enough now. Book.com. Let's see if that all works. That looks good. That looks good. That looks good. That looks good. That's recording. And I'm going to hit go live. Ba bam. In theory, we are going live as we speak. Did everyone put their seatbelts on? Hope so. So, welcome back. I think we are now streaming. Bum, 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 bum. Um, today if for module three is challenging because number one, it's about enough. And I will be completely wrought with like time management. We have to get through seven questions, um, which is fine because we don't get to them all. Read the damn book. And the questions are at the back of the book. So we're going to see how much conversation we can get to in an hour and say it with me. That's going to be good enough, right? See what I did there? Good job. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much for coming back. Thank you for reading. Thank you for joining in and some of the conversation on Canvas. If you have done that, if you haven't, that is also completely fine. Um, you get to do whatever you want to at your own pace because it is actually designed to be your book club. Fun facts. Um, so we're just gonna jump in. No matter where you are in the book or the activities, just a reminder that the discussion questions you don't have to disclose anything that came up while you were doing the activities. So we are having discussion questions after you have potentially done processes that maybe have dug some stuff up. I say that just because I don't want this to feel like you have to share things that you're not necessarily comfortable sharing. Um, and we are also role modeling for other people how you do this, how you do your own work and take responsibility for yourself, right? So. Here we go, that's what we do. So first question is what judgments and assumptions do you feel, uh, do you make so that you feel safe and prepared? Who would like to jump in? I can start. Wonderful, thank you so much. I um, always try to assess um, what I consider safety in terms of uh, like new environments, um, like acceptance of uh, diversity is one of them. Like I try to make sure I assess if um, the new people I meet are um, uh, okay with, uh, for example, members of LGBTQ community before I fully disclose um, who I am, so. Sure, feeling safe and prepared to yeah. disclose or not disclose your own identities. Right. Great. And with that, I make judgments sometimes. I make assumptions like, oh, is this person 
uh, religious and would that mean that maybe they won't be open to LGBTQ and sometimes it's a wrong judgment so right often it is so yeah. some religious people are totally open and some religious people are also LGBTQ right right exactly yeah excellent okay what judgments and assumptions do you make to feel safe and prepared anybody else um I think a lot of times I mean it kind of lines up with giving people the benefit of the doubt so a lot of times we kind of uh, go the opposite direction on that and we end up kind of uh, discounting people and making assumptions about them in a negative way because we're kind of scared of um, maybe the acceptance we're not maybe prepared for that so I think judgments and assumptions wise uh, it can actually be you know um, thinking that somebody might think something negative of you uh, before you've even allowed them to speak. I think that's that's a big problem that I used to have um, and I still work on that a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed specifically as a like a diversity educator is that I was told, and maybe this is also like white woman stuff. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate like what have I learned through my group memberships and what have I learned as Jessica, right? I've never been anything but this. But um, I have heard forever, you're never, ever, 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 ever supposed to make judgments and assumptions, right? So if we assume, right, we all know how to spell. So it make, if you assume it makes an ass out of you and me, so don't do it. And then what I find in my own work and in talking with audiences, et cetera, is that my participants then feel guilty and ashamed when they begin to realize that they have been making judgments and assumptions. Um, so like, I think, uh, I know some of y'all work in hospitals. So just as an example, I did some consulting work with a children's ER and they have access to uh, taxi vouchers and the patient or the patient's family gets to ask for a taxi voucher, but they also have the ability to volunteer. And so they would pick and choose who to volunteer because they didn't wanna be offensive by assuming someone needed a voucher, but they also would then not offer it to people who actually really did based on what they thought. And then it got even one step further is that people who needed them, they kind of self-determined that they got too many vouchers. Like they've used it too many times so they don't get any more vouchers, but there's no process or rules, right? We make judgments and assumptions, I believe, so that we kind of know which part of us kind of going back to covering which part of us can show up here and how should we show up? And we then feel safe and prepared. So we begin, but that doesn't make it accurate. It just means that's how our lived experience has taught us to preemptively interpret the variables that we see that may or may not be accurate. Fascinating. What a fascinating pattern to discover. Um, what were your initial thoughts or uh, reflections around my concept of differently right? Which, just for those of you playing along, is not moral relativism. It's very different. I believe in one sense of morality, but I do believe that there is a possibility of like grace that somebody else's life maybe has taught them that this is appropriate. I vehemently disagree with this, but like for 20 seconds, what does differently right mean in that kind of situation? How'd that resonate with you? You know, for some reason that comes easy to me, um, accepting other people uh, differently right. I think maybe working in healthcare and working with patients at the end of life, I've realized that there's very little certainty or one way of doing things right. And um, so overall that for the most part comes easy to me, except when I see uh, someone else's rights being violated. I feel like that's when I just don't understand why would somebody do something like that. So that's where I become judgmental and, and I don't see the different, how they are right uh, but then I start thinking like, okay, maybe their, their upbringing has made them discriminate against certain people. So I try to understand it, but it's not a very difficult thing for me. 
Mm -hmm. Interesting. And good on you for noticing like when it's more comfortable and maybe when it's uncomfortable, um, which is different than when it is accurate versus inaccurate. Right. It's just your behaviors in the moment. Great. Any other comments about differently right? I have an example that makes me laugh when I think about it is that I, when I travel with a, one of my friends, um, she thinks that you only take pictures and you have to be in the picture. So if you're like by the Eiffel Tower, then you have to have the Eiffel Tower, Tower behind you. And I'm the total opposite is that when you, I need pictures of what I'm seeing and not me in the picture. Mm -hmm. And so we had an interesting time trying to decide how to take pictures when we were traveling together. Yeah. And that's such a good example from out here, like just take two photographs. But in the moment when you don't know that you're operating with a different set of expectations, I'm sure at some moment you were like, why do you keep getting in my picture? And I had to process why I didn't want to be in the picture. So there was some underlining things that I need to discover about myself. And we are good friends, so we could have an interesting conversation around it too, to like, well, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. You know, that's really interesting. I think um, it makes me wonder, like, it's okay if it's, if both options are okay. Like, let's take a picture with the Eiffel Tower and let's take a picture without it. But I think maybe it's when one, uh, one uh, idea gets um, put down as uh, not appropriate. Like if the then it becomes an argument like it's not okay to do both we should do one or the other i feel like that's that's a time when there is a uh, lack of agreement mm -hmm. but if i would have gone along with her the whole time and not identified what was really going on with me my in other circumstances when i have like just got along with it because I don't agree with it and try to figure it out. Then I come out sideways in snarky remarks that have nothing to do with really what's going on. It has to do with, I don't want to be yeah. in a picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it's, it's good foreshadowing for uh, what well, you did a lot of activities around crucible moments. Um, so, so an example that I will also offer up and then we'll move on to kind of what kind of crucible moments you're interested in sharing. But one of the fascinating things when you decide to share your life with a human being is you realize that you have different operational definitions that are inarguable because you didn't realize that it was your definition. So for example, I married a very proper, polite, I believe is the word that he would use to describe himself, very proper, polite uh, Irishman, right? So if you were to go, if, if, if he and I were to go and visit somebody's house, now this is COVID, so this is all obviously hypothetical right now. But if we were to go to visit somebody's house, um, we have very different expectations of what that means. I am a rowdy Texan Southerner. So let's say that I'm gonna go to Patty's house. Well, first off, you can't show up empty handed, you have to bring a present. Now. Do I like Patty? Because if I'm going to bring her something on a dish, Patty is going to have to refill that dish and give that dish back to me, which means I have to invite her over to my house. And if I don't really like her, then you put it on a paper plate. So then you don't have to get the dish back, right? Like there is forethought in what's happening. I don't know how to cook. So now I got to plan the thing to put on the dish or the paper plate, depending on your status. And you have to make it look like you didn't actually choose a paper plate you just didn't have the proper dish because of course you you're very important to me but the signal is clear right if you come to my house you immediately kick off your shoes and go fetch yourself a beverage or a snack so you don't take off your shoes because it's impolite to wear your shoes you kick off your shoes because you should be completely comfortable and like fend for yourself in the house this is very much how i operate well evidently in teetotaler world that is all terribly rude because you don't pre-plan not seeing someone again. And you certainly don't go rifling through people's cabinets without their permission. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. I'm being complimentary, right? Like I am so comfortable here. I feel like a snack. 
So when my guest goes and finds me, or I'm their guest, the house, the host, that's the word I'm looking for, finds me in the fridge eating a pickle, I take that as a compliment. Evidently, I'm horrifically rude. Who knew? We'd been married a number of years before we actually had the nerve to address these operational differences. And then to be completely frank, it was really embarrassing to me, right? It was really embarrassing to me that I had humiliated my partner multiple times because I was working with my definitions, which were so diabolically different than his definitions, but we'd never had the conversation. And then in the moment when you are like, what are you doing? is not the best time to be like, we should really examine our operational definitions of what it means to be a host or a guest. So Patty, you did an excellent job with the photographs is that when that happens, you could dive into that conversation or you can do your own work. Most of us are gonna avoid this conversation unless we of course are correct and they're the ones who have done wrong. And then we're gonna jump in probably not actually well articulating our thoughts. So the precursor to that is who taught me these rules? Why don't you want to be in a photograph? Why do I think that it's completely okay to make yourself at home? And like in my world, that's related to class. It's related to education. It's related to a bunch of different variables that I just thought was everybody, but it's actually just me. So that does kind of bring us back to the crucible moment activities. So. What are some of the most crucible moments that you are interested in sharing that you noticed really shifted? Um, do the examples range from both positive or negative or lean in one particular direction? And then the third rail, which is another concept, how does it show up? And Alan, specifically, you had a really great answer for what I would consider your third rail, which is your how I, I identified what you wrote was that the, the crucible moments you remember the most are when you acted, and my guess would be probably didn't act because that's also an action, but which if you identify as a head heart person, then that third piece is action. So those crucible moments may have like really risen off the page to you. So what do y'all think? And Alan, you're welcome to start if you want, since I used you as a positive example. Yeah, I mean, that exactly what you said. I think being a heart and head person, I just remember actions as meaningful. And it could even be sometimes like on a vacation, I could really enjoy just reading a book and uh, kind of being in my thoughts and meditating and I'm sitting on the beach and my kids are playing and like sometimes just getting out doing something, it makes it so memorable. And like, that's just one example, but sometimes it's about let's say injustice or discrimination, like I can think about it, I can logically argue against it, but it's those moments when I speak up and I say, like when someone says something that's discriminatory against somebody else, assuming that I'm gonna be okay with it and I speak up and I say, that's not okay with me. And those are for me, crucible moment. And it has a lot to do with action or inaction. Mm -hmm. And if I don't say something in that moment, that sticks with me too. I've, it makes it, the inaction is also a crucible moment. Interesting. Any other examples? Do any of you have any crucibles you want to share? And then which of the third rails patterns did you notice positive or negative? So I've had several things that I've identified as crucible moments. And I noticed I've, and I've known this for a while, I view the world through rose colored glasses. I just do. So anything that I had my identity stolen one time and I was like, huh. And so you have a lot of actions and action is my third rail. I do great in crisis because that's, it's action, action, action. I don't have time to think or feel about it. Um, But I was in a relationship with someone that was not good. And what it showed me was his lack of support. And I'm like, I'm out. So it, I consider that a good thing, even though all the headache I had to deal with most anything that's happened, I've been able to find that positive spin to it. And it's made changes in my life that later have been very positive. That didn't seem positive at the time. It's, you know, gotten me out of bad relationships. It's changed a career path. It's done so many great things. And I try, 
I just focus on that and try not to get down about the, the hard parts around it, but the work is always worth it. And so it's, it's funny because act in action is my challenge on a regular basis. But when I get to those crucible moments, action is all I do. And I don't think, and I don't feel I deal with that stuff later. Yeah. Well, remember just a nudge that the heart part is not the feeling. The feeling, according to my shrink, are logical responses to situations. Therefore, they are heady. So in this case, heart, we want to say feelings because we're used to hearts and emotions and stuff. But in this case, heart is big ideas, right? And so Hillary, because I've worked with you so closely, I would say your big ideas about community and inclusion and letting everybody's voice be heard, that is like a, a go-to automatic way you have a conversation because you'll yeah. slow, no matter how detailed the questions are, like, give me your bylaws. And you're like, oh, what does it mean to be sharing <laughs> these documents with like an outside consultant? Like, let me give you some context, right? Like not to be hypothetically speaking, of course, Hillary, <laughs> right? right. But then the action or the inaction piece, that's the the uh, crucible, the, the crucible moment is this was a definitive thing. And then you're noticing how your third rail shows up just like Alan. Great. Anybody else have a crucible moment that made them identify their third rail that is into action? I know some of you so well that I could call on you, but I'm waiting for you to volunteer, my dear people. Well, good Jim. job. I was going to call on you, Jim. <laughs> Jim is a very high action person on a given day. Then I would imagine if there is a scenario that you might identify as a crucible moment, I am curious if head or heart shows up to you as your third, or am I totally off base? Heart is definitely my third, my third rail. Um, and I like the crucible moments that come up for me are when my, my mother's last last years of life. Um, and my, my brother died, uh, my younger brother died, and then it was just me and her, and I was more and more in a caregiving role. And there was a lot of action to be done, a lot of thinking, and but really, um, like she and I both, we just got more and more into our hearts and it was a new experience. <laughs> for us, especially relating to each other, because I'd always been pretty guarded with her. And um, by the very end, the last few days in the hospital when we knew she was dying, uh, she was, we were just, we were really close. And, um, and I was able to, uh, you know, to just absorb it and be there. And I don't, and I hadn't experienced anything like that with her before. And, um, so it was, uh, it changed me. And it still warms my heart thinking about it. Mm. And as a, a great example of heart, what I hear from you, Jim, is that in those moments, it's not just an emotional connection, but it was like a presence that you were able to share in those moments, right? Like, do you see how that's so much bigger than just like a feeling word? But when you're when the ideas and the concepts are coming from that third place, when you line up all three variables, you're completely unstoppable. And sometimes you see that going into a crucible moment, and sometimes it's a, a result of a crucible moment. Sometimes you know the results quickly. And Hillary, I would challenge you probably is that in the moment of a really negative experience. Um, maybe it feels negative and you can find the positive, but I would also imagine sometimes there are very negative things that years later, these positives have come out of it because it, it was fertile ground for something, you know? Inside COVID, I also tend to be an optimist. And inside COVID, I've tried really hard every day to start and end the day with something positive because of this particular period of time. And um, what, what encouraged me to do that is a really good friend of mine, Beth, her and her husband plant flowers every year. And she was a speech, is a speaker like me and traveled like I used to, or like she used to. And it was in the springtime. And she said, I've never been home 
to see the plants bloom. We always, we always plant them and I might come home with them in bloom, but I've never gotten to see them from planting to the bloom stage. And that wouldn't have happened without COVID. And that was my like, aha, you have to do the thing with the heart again. Like it's about life and home and a stillness that I had designed an entire life away from. So in a lot of ways, COVID has become a crucible moment for me or this period has. Anyone else have anything to share before we move on to unsafe versus uncomfortable? With this, um, the crucible moments, as I was thinking about it through this week, is I had originally identified that I was a head action and I am a head heart and I was only action in my work environment because I had to be that action. I had to do like, that was the, so I, I, at my core, I am a head and heart and action is, action is my third row. <laughs> so what, because then when I look at my crucible moments, I'm thinking, oh, that makes sense of how I tolerated things longer than I might, might then was healthy for me mm. because I wasn't willing to take action. Well, and if I remember correctly, last time, Patty, you shared that you have recently retired Right. So even just switching from that environment to not that environment in itself could be a crucible moment where you are now noticing these patterns. Yeah. And layer and layer a new retirement pat, like the freedom of retirement to COVID. And it gets kind of mixed up and confusing pretty quickly. And it's like, I'm not like really sure who I am right now, but I'll, I'll show up. <laughs> It's Friday, if that's helpful. Yeah. Like, yeah. I feel like I just need someone to show up and be like, by the way, eat lunch. Um, all right, great, good discussion. So question number four is what is the difference between unsafe and uncomfortable? I could talk about this for days. I love this question. How does this, <coughs> how does this show up in our work? And note, I do not necessarily mean our employment, right? I mean our work. Uh, do we use our discomfort as an excuse and justify it by saying we feel unsafe? Have you ever felt unsafe and had it dismissed as just discomfort? How's that for a little word cloud? Oh, okay, I'll jump in again here, Jessica. And um, this goes, thinking back to when we did that gun forum in Eureka, and we both did so much outreach to the, to the gun people. And I, had, I walked into uh, the gun section of Pacific Outfitters, it's like the whole second floor, and I was really scared. I'd never been in a place like that before, 60 some years old. Uh, it was very uncomfortable, um, but uh, if I had seen it as unsafe, I guess I had seen it as unsafe before, but it was, you know, taking, making this commitment with you and, to, and realizing we had to really reach out and build trust with these folks, or they weren't going to participate. Mm -hmm. That's what impelled me, drove me to step out of my comfort zone, way out. And it was a wonderful experience. I mean, I had three or four conversations. Um, I learned a lot, but I'll tell you, there was one thing that happened there that I still regret. And that was, a, there was a guy in there who said, I'm, he's a customer, I'm here to buy a handgun because some illegal immigrant killed my wife. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're nuts, you know? Whereas in truth, that was an opportunity for connection, right? I mean, he, he, um, he was in grief and um, he was revealing his 
greatest wound right there in the gun store. And, you know, I, I recoiled because of my, pre my prejudice about his prejudice, <laughs> my assumptions about him being a racist jerk or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, it, it's lovely that you bring that up too, that when, so just to kind of recap in case you didn't know, so Jim and I facilitated this conversation together. It was Jim's idea. He got referred to me because he needed like a co-facilitator, something, your, your eye candy, I don't know why. So in talking with Jim, it became, so here are my judgments and assumptions, but it became very clear that uh, Jim was not going to be the pro-gun person out of the facilitators. So I'm going to have to be. And I was like, mm, that is not fit. What do I do? So I took the concealed and carry class. And part of the class is the part two class is you go to the gun range and you fire like a hundred different weapons. Um, and while I was also at part two of the class, I realized that an AK-47 was not in the lineup. And so I had to tell the instructor like, as a pinko commie liberal, if I don't fire an AK-47, this is moot, right? And he's like, hold on. He went and got his AK-47 out of his truck. And I had to do that in my yeah, opinion. AR-15, wasn't it? Um, no, I think it was an AK-47. I don't know. Who knows? It, it was a, a gun I would not purchase. So at the end of the class, this is what I thought was really amazing. So very uncomfortable for me, but very safe. I felt really safe, but I wanted to be able to make a program with Jim and I wanted those people to feel safe, which included the people who would be super pro gun. So like, I'm all in, I have to do this. I must action, right? Like I'm very high action, go take a class. All right, I'll go take a class. So I go and take a class. So at the end of the class, one of the things, and I think this is how they sell guns, but um, they said, okay, so now that you fire these things, which weapon would you buy if you had to buy a gun? And I was so fascinated by how instantaneous my response was. And I might screw this up, but again, this is about unsafe versus uncomfortable and being dismissed versus not being dismissed. So everyone else is talking about exactly the guns they want and need and multiple ones and holsters and things. So I said that I would want a single action long gun. And they were like, they kind of laughed at me because everyone else is getting like a semi-automatic little teeny tiny handgun, et cetera. And they were like, why would you want that? And I said, now that I have a very clear understanding, I want to know that I am about to employ the use of a bullet. And they're like, right, but you're probably going to get killed. And I was like, that was going to happen before anyway. So I have embraced that this is okay for me. I actually feel safe knowing that I have made this choice. But to answer your question, I, this is where I would be. So I got very comfortable with the vocabulary. I felt very safe. And then the last thing I'll say, because then I want to hear other, um, uh, Julianne, welcome. We're on number four, if you're interested. But uh what was interesting was we did the whole program. It was great. I think, Jim, you would agree. It went well. It was great. And I would say that the whole experience was a crucible moment for me for a number of different reasons. And at the end, in the parking lot, I don't know, Jim, if you remember this, but one of the people in the parking lot um, brandished their weapon. Like they had a gun with them and they took it out. And brandished means that it became visible, which is illegal. They brandished their weapon and all of a sudden like this, all of this judgment came back because now I felt mama bear protective of everyone there. And uh, Jim and his partner were getting in the car and I was like, ah! so I ran to the gun instructor and said, they're brandishing their weapon because I knew exactly what words to use. And the instructor took care of the person who was showcasing their gun. But then the instructor felt unsafe and uncomfortable because it represented them badly. Right. So like the whole thing had gone full circle and it stuck with me. And I think that full circle is what made it such a crucible moment for me that really showed what community means. So this is my heart part showing up, what community means, what trust means. They trusted me as much as I trusted them. They were uncomfortable as much as I was uncomfortable. And I hadn't noticed that because I'm self-absorbed basically. I only knew how I felt. So 
that's where that one comes up for me, just as an example to, to extrapolate again. Thank you again for the opportunity. Other thoughts? Any of you ever had your um, lack of safety dismissed as not real or used it safety as an excuse when you're really just uncomfortable? So that's actually on a, I guess, more surface level um, for myself. I, Hillary and Jess, I talked to you right before everybody else got on about how my day started, which was in tears in my physical therapist's office. So what we've been doing is trying to work on, I broke my back last year. So um, we've been trying to work through some pain issues and stuff with that. Um, it's interesting though, because uh, what's happening right now is the pain is coming from my, you know, our, our kind of instinct to protect whatever is damaged. So the pain comes from the muscles around the nerve and the, the break, right? So I'm protecting that. That's, that's um, scary for me though, because I feel unsafe when I reach a, a certain level, like if I'm doing something and it's reaching that level of pain, I reached that point where I'm like, I don't feel safe. I feel like my leg's going to fall off. But then um, I'm having my physical therapist kind of reassure me that, you know, it's safe. Your leg's not going to fall off, but you're going to be uncomfortable. So I'm sitting there going, okay, I can, I can do this. However, this, you just said about like uh, being discounted, being dismissed, she was trying to explain to me the neurological, uh, you know, sense of pain, right? She was telling me though, in such a way where it was like, you, you are avoiding two minutes of pain because when it happens, it happens very intensely for a couple of minutes. And then I can get myself out of it usually in the day. But uh, she, the way she said it was, you're avoiding two minutes of pain so that, um, you know, you, you can just, you don't pick up your daughter because it's going to be two minutes of pain and you're not going to make that worth it. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> like it got to me so bad that I just, I broke down right then. And it was, it was just her dismissive tone and her way of like something that is, you know, really affecting my daily life right now. And especially when it comes to our children, our daughters, our sons, it's that just hit me at that particular nerve to, for lack of a better term. But yeah, that, that's a crucible moment for me. I, I guess that happened today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, the, I guess the last thing I'd add before we move on to number five is that what I think is interesting, and you'll notice like at the beginning of the book club, I did not do safe space rules right? Like I do not do that at the beginning of sessions because number one, I have no idea how to make a bunch of people feel safe, even if we're in the same room, right? Like I, the stuff that I do is about you unpacking whatever you need to unpack. And then I scratch like a lotto ticket. So you pat, unpack one more box. Well, for some, that is a very thin line. And for others, you are much more willing to do work. I don't know that, right? Then throw in social media and Twitter and sensitivities and am I being offensive and what's going to happen to me and am I going to get upset? Like, I can't do that. And so I stopped doing safe space rules before any kind of program. And when I co-facilitate or when I'm working with somebody else who's a facilitator, they're like, why are you not doing this? And I believe it's because it's my responsibility that if I say I'm going to create a safe space, then I have to follow through on that and I can't do it. But what I can do is try to role model me being vulnerable and feeling safe and challenged in a space and hope that other people can do the same thing. Now that works with my line of work, but it doesn't work in other lines of work. So I don't have those jobs, but I know that there are times where I've been like, I don't feel safe here when I use the word. And what I really mean is, is I am very uncomfortable. And I'm usually uncomfortable with race or class differences than what I'm experienced to. And there's a difference and I'm responsible for the discomfort and I'm responsible for keeping myself safe, but there's a difference. And I'm not 
being responsible for my own safety if I conflate them because I want to be comfortable. There's a, there's a difference. So that's my work to do, right? That's your work to do. So number five, if we are responsible for the accuracy of our stories, when have you left room for edits for someone else's truth? So we talked earlier about times that we make judgments and assumptions. So leaving room for edits is about extra wide margins, triple space, you're responsible for the first draft of the story. So when have you left room for edits for someone else's truth? Maybe you've even done this for your own truth, your own discovery, your own self-reflections. And why is leaving room for edits so hard sometimes? Because we want to print a story. So Jim, I'm thinking of the guy at the gun store. We want to print a story on like the fastest printer in two point font with zero space between any of the words because we're right. Why does that happen when we know that that's not appropriate? Why? What's the difference? When has this happened to you? What are you noticing? So I noticed a lot um, when I went from small town, Texas to smaller town in Missouri, but a more global college. There were women from all over the country and then all over the world. So the international students have taught me a lot, um, but there was a specific incident that has really stuck with me. And um, I had a friend, she was from um, Serbia, Montenegro. And one of our planes had just been shot down over their country. And I was so upset by it, you know, go America. And she was cheering and I was like, what are you doing? Do you know where you, <laughs> and she said, Hillary, your country is not welcome here. And here's why. And she gave me her perspective and it really took me back because, you know, I live in America. This is, you know, we are right all the time. And while I know logically that's not true, um, just having her perspective really set me back. And so it, Kind of made me rethink moving forward what different people's experiences are you know i'm all i've always had this kumbaya let's get along everybody world peace attitude but hearing it from a different point of view especially globally when we're the invaders and we're the ones trying to tell other people how to live and she really put that in perspective if someone was doing that to us or our country we would be so upset and so offended and so understanding that helps me edit other times. Um, it's easier for me to edit adult experiences though than it is for the youth experiences because those are pretty much set. I saw things as a child and had those very young views, but as an adult, um, just that one particular experience has changed how I allow edits to come in. Hmm, that's really cool. What a cool thing to notice. Anyone else wanna share? When is this easy? When is it hard? Julianne, welcome. Thank you. Um, I, for me, uh, this is certainly different now in my life than it was 30, 40 years ago. And I think a part of it is I have more patience, which is something I will fight with my whole life. Um, and part of it is learning how to be in the moment, learning how to listen better. And when I do that, I tend to leave a lot more room for edits, not only for me, but for other people and actions and words. Um, I find that if I'm in a situation or a conversation and I realize, I come to realize there's another perspective. Now in my life, that also makes me realize there's probably 50 other perspectives. It's like one triggers the rest. And so then I'm much more open to edits. It's, it's kind of a trigger that's happening in me now. Oh, there's another perspective. Okay, that means there's 50. And unless this person particularly, let's say I'm having a conversation, particularly tells me, then I just got to accept the fact that there's another perspective. I don't need 
to understand it even sometimes, right? To me, sometimes I think we try so hard to understand, but what's the difference? It's just a, a different perspective. Um, so um, I think more active listening and more practice at being now uh, has given me more opportunity for edits for myself as well as for others, right? So then I don't get into my own locked behavior. Wow, I can change my mindset. I can change my own behavior. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And I, I, I really like, and I, uh, in my own world, it's interesting that this was almost a chapter, but uh, searching to understand and searching to understand so that you can be right, right? Like Julianne, I heard that. And what you were saying is that you search to understand and you've caught yourself, at least what I heard, is searching to understand if you could be right. And like, instead of detouring to there, you're trying to stay over here, right? Like what a great example of acknowledging a pattern and then making a choice of I am going to try to not do that pattern. You know, like Julianne was joking at the beginning of the book club that she was there when I came up with the idea of the book, but more importantly is that she was actually there when I did a talk that was called Leave Room for Edits. It's actually called How to Matter. And I had never said the words Leave Room for Edits. It just like was a throwaway line while I was trying to figure out what to say. And everyone who heard that, that was like, that was the first thing I ever had that went viral on Twitter. And I did, I was like, do I have to take an antibiotic? I don't even know what that means. How do I log into Twitter? What is going on? And so then when I told people that I was going to write a book, people who heard that in the moment were like, it's going to be called leave room for edits. Right. And I was like, no, like that might be a chapter. And they're like, no, the whole book. It was amazing. But like, if you only had leave room for edits, I'm not saying it's not smart, but like it's just one piece of recognizing your patterns impact your ability to connect with other people. And so many times we want to be right. And I think that my impression is that part of the reason everybody wanted the book to be called leave room for edits is they wanted to find out how to edit so that they would be correct. And that's why I was like, uh -uh, no, we're not writing that book. But I needed that nudge to figure out why am I writing this book, which then got even more into being enough, which is really what this module is about, is working with what you got and doing the best you can, which is often really not accurate, not right, could be better. And it's what you're doing. And that is grabbing responsibility for what you're actually doing. So on that note, uh, if we are responsible for the accuracy of, oh, I already read that one, sorry. The accuracy of the stories, that's what made me think of it. How can you use your dominant or privileged identities to advocate for others? Your, how can you use your dominant or privileged identities to advocate for yourself? Is there a connection? P.S., the answer is yes. Is there a connection between your intentions and your sense of entitlement? So we already talked a little bit about that. And how does this impact intended or unintentional? How does this impact other people? Are you claiming your own sense of responsibility for who and how you are in your relationships? I do not ask yes, no questions, evidently. <laughs> How do you use, we'll start like little bits, your dominant or your privileged identities. How do you use them to advocate for yourself or others? And how is that different than because of your dominant and privileged identities feeling entitled to things? Let's do that first. Um, you know, I, I had a, when you, when you said that, what, one of the things I'm thinking about is an experience I had a few months ago um, 
walking with a friend, uh, a person of color. Um, and I just, we came to a corner and there was a red light. And I, I looked both ways, no cars were coming and I just started walking across the street. And he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm crossing the street. There are no cars coming. He says, I can't do that. I said, yes, you can. Just, there's no cars. And it had not occurred to me that as a white person, I can do that. As a black person, he could not. And that had never, ever occurred to me that he would get noticed just crossing the street where I wouldn't. And um, it was, it was like, I had, I didn't even consider crossing the street could be a privilege that I have that someone else doesn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you ask that question, that's, that's what came up for me was, and it was just like, wow. And I've, I've thought a lot about that since then. And now I can't cross the street without thinking about, oh, he can't do that. That's really weird. <laughs> You know, that he, that he has to worry even about crossing a street. Yeah. Or, or even if he doesn't have to worry because there are no cars coming, literally does not need to worry, but his right. life has taught him that he has to worry. What right. a fundamental difference because of your dominant or privileged identity. So it's great. Yeah. And Jax, I think what's important too for everyone else too is that what's interesting I find in a lot of diversity work is that we are supposed to gather, build community around all of our subordinated and marginalized identities and our pain and our suffering and all the things that whoever's the power group doesn't understand about us. And by doing that, we're actually keeping systems of power and systems of oppression in place. We feel really good about it. T-shirts, bumper stickers, community, all that stuff is very important. But if we're gonna dismantle it, we have to be able to notice, and Jackson, such a great example is that as a white person, never dawned on you. You are literally looking, am I going to get hit by a car? Not, am I representing an entire group of people who are going to get noticed or get charged with jaywalking? Or if a police officer were to be involved, the outcome of that could be significantly different. But just by noticing from those dominant and privileged identities, that noticing, I believe, is dismantling a system. I'm not saying that the community doesn't matter, but until more of these dismantlings happen, we can do organizing, we can do work, we can do reflection, we can be responsible at no cost, no risk from our privileged and dominant identities. That's, that's all we have to do. But it's not a sexy feeling because you have to take responsibility for how you got there, which gets to that entitlement versus your own advocacy from a place of privilege. Great example. Other thoughts or comments? Let me make sure I'm not muted there. Um, I mean, in my personal life, I've kind of come across the same sort of situation, except for when it comes to uh, like my gay friends or people that I've, I've had the opportunity to volunteer for certain places or certain organizations that uh, have not allowed people of a different sexual orientation um, to volunteer for them because of, of their life, you know, like who they are. And that, that was a huge wake up call for me. Um, in fact, I started out in radio, um, at a station that we, if, if a person had been out, they would not be welcome to, uh, work for them. And that, that, it wasn't until after I had started and I had, you know, kind of done some growing and stuff for the next couple of years past that, that I realized that it was my privilege to be there. And it was my privileged identity that allowed it. I didn't realize how different it was for other people. So using that going forward, um, I lost a couple of friends to situations like that. I lost them to suicide because they were not accepted for who they were. And I've tried so hard ever since to just kind of 
you know, be open about advocating for every life and be open about advocating for the fact that we are completely privileged in our situations um, in different ways. So um, mine happens to be, you know, I, I am not a person of color. I'm a heterosexual female, you know, in my mid thirties. Like I, I, I have it easy you know, overall. So I just try to use that in the best way I can. Um, and recognizing that, like you said, Jess, like recognizing that I think was really the key to stopping my own behavior going forward. I don't support things like that any longer that would exclude people like that. Um, and it changed my life doing that. Nice. Thanks for your allyship, you know, like what, what is interesting about the words allyship or advocacy is so often I get asked as if somebody's preparing for future uh, engagements so that they can be an ally or be an advocate in the future. But you can be an ally and an advocate because of something that you did in the past. And your past can inform you to stay the course. Your past can inform you to change. But the only way you're going to get there is if you really take responsibility for who and how you are in your past and who and how you are in your present so that you can ideally maybe make a slightly just baby fraction, little whisper, whisker of a more conscious choice of who and how you're going to be moving forward. And repeat process, right? Like ideally that's it. That, that actually is a great segue to number seven which is taking space, right? So what does taking space mean to you when, when you either read that part or when you just, just say it out loud right now, right? Like take space. What does that mean? What does it not mean? Um, if you say it in different ways, does the meaning change? Um, how can we use those meanings for, uh, for allyship and advocacy? Well, again, taking space to me is kind of like everything else that you discussed before I got here and, and while I was here is giving yourself the opportunity to see the world through someone else's eyes, like what Jax was talking about um, or what Dara just shared. And also to me, giving space is allowing myself and other people to grow and change. So the, the, the example that I really like is when Kevin Hart was kicked off of whatever uh, award show because he had had a tweet 12 years before that was homophobic. And instead of fighting that, he backed off. But one of the points he made was, and other people too, including me, is you have to give people space to grow and change. And um, I think that is, uh, I have found in my life, as my life has, whatever areas it has changed largely, it's really hard for other people to see me, I'll talk about me in another light. And I, I think that's um, because people don't give space for change. I, I know I've done it. I'm not saying I haven't, but to me, the biggest thing about giving space is being able to uh, um, see how other people are working to change their life in a positive way. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else, Alan, did you want in about take space? Yeah, I think that um, that resonates. Uh, and it's really, for me, it was hard to, initially hard to understand what it, uh, what you meant by take space, but I really think it, it's all about not rushing into judgment 
or when we do and we are called out just to slow down and really reflect and um, just realize why we're responding like that and why others are responding the way they, they are acting or uh, behaving or mm -hmm. things they're saying. So I, I think it's about slowing down, not rushing, and then just reflection. And there's a, a consciousness to taking it. Right. Yeah. From a, I work with people of older ages in living communities and taking space is when you're getting old and frail and you don't wanna bother anybody, literally their body, like their posture changes. And so we work with doing different postures to say, hello old world, I'm here and claiming their space in the world. Um, and so it can be taking spaces, looking at when you go invisible because you don't wanna bother anybody or do anything. So that is a consciousness of saying, how much space or how little space do you take up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I had a, an interesting conversation with a client a couple of weeks ago in reference to uh, man spreading and how man spreading and man spleening, how that how does that you tell people to take space? And um, so so in case these are new words, so man spreading is sitting like as big as possible. I've never had testicles, but I've heard people, specifically people with testicles, telling me that things need to air out and you need blood circulation and draftiness and things like that. And I'm like, I'm fat. I have skin folds. I maybe that's a place of empathy. I could understand, right? So like when I have to like tuck my shirt so that my skin folds have cloth in between them, I get, okay, okay. But I know how to sit in public without interfering other people's ability to sit down. What, I, what the reason why I'm bringing this up is that taking space, if it's conscious, is empowering. But it can also be a power move to take space. And my, my challenge to folks is if you are consciously taking space as an empowering or a power move from a dominant, and privileged identity, the consciousness of the move is a consciousness that allows you to recognize you are doing something from a place of privilege. That's what the consciousness is about. It's not about the centimeters that you're actually physically taking up, although that would be nice for you to be conscious of. But when it was interesting, and in this particular case, I of course got mansplained in a TED talk about why manspreading and taking space, I'm giving him permission to do this, but it was the consciousness of how you are utilizing this time, right? So I ended up having a conversation with him about his privileged identities, but then I also was able for him to provide a space, to take space for himself, for his subordinated or marginalized experiences, and when he had to feel small. And where it was either writing a story he could be proud of, or sometimes these are rooted in perseverance or resilience or strength or the fight or the hustle or something like that, right? Like the chutzpah that's going on. But that's taking space from a subordinated, marginalized, silencing experience. So I just wanna name that that confusion can exist out there. And I think, we are responsible for what we are conscious of. And then we are conscious of what patterns we are doing, some of them, and then we can be conscious of which patterns we will continue to do. That is a very different way than taking space. Um, but there is also, a, there have been moments in my life where that the declaration of taking space from those subordinated or marginalized existing spaces, right? So Patty, you mentioned like older people or something that the, the reclaiming of my own space from those subordinated, marginalized, silenced, painful places has been very healing and brings me back to discomfort and lack of safety. 
that then actually enabled me to have some empathy with my dominant and privileged identities that also feel unsafe and uncomfortable because they're, I've been operating from this space in a very unconscious way. And I operate from this space, the subordinated space in a much more conscious way. So I'm just asking to kind of use this skill set over here some of the time. And that's what I mean by using what you already got some of the time, doing the best you can with what you already got. So that's awesome. What are your last thoughts as we move into next week is we're doing the whole now section all at once, pressure on module four, because we skipped January 1st because I was not prepared. So we're going to do all of now next week. But any last parting thoughts? We've done the prologue, we've done good, and we've done enough. Thoughts or comments? I'm just kind of uh, really, with what we've already discussed so far in all of our book clubs, I'm really impressed with how it's sort of funneling all these different aspects of our ourselves into something that is so usable. It's it's like challenging yourself and it's uncomfortable, but it's awesome. And I'm so appreciating it. I think I can speak for some others here too. So we love it. <laughs> nice. And it's not at the cost or the burden of somebody else to do your own work. Like that's when, when I kind of stumbled into this and was like, clearly this will not work for anybody else. And then I like kind of started experimenting. I was like, oh my gosh, like I don't have to burden my like one friend with X identity to help me deal with how that identity does or doesn't impact me. I actually can just sit here and have a conversation with myself. You know, um, I'm curious when y'all were doing some of the activities, did any of you throw the book across the room? Because I still do. And I wrote the damn book. But when I go through the activities, I'm like, I don't want to have this conversation with myself. Thank goodness I don't have to be witnessed by someone because I look like a nutcase. And all I'm doing is reviewing my own life. Ugh. Why would I want anyone else to do that work? I will admit I've shut the book a couple of times because I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to take a nap. I'm not trying to like, you know, search myself right now, but. <laughs> Patty, did you want to say something? Yep. Um, I was trying to find it in the book, but I can't. But somewhere in here, you have that Venn diagram of us and them. And um, can you just say anything more about that? I'm being quizzed on my own book. Um, let me see if I can find it, because I don't want to say anything wrong. Does anybody know what, I'm ta what she's talking about, what Patty's talking about? No, but while you're looking, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's on this call and who has written, um, exposed themselves by writing online, because I really appreciate that just as much as these discussions. So I just wanted to say thank you. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you're also doing your own work on your own, and then you're discussing your own work on Facebook, on Canvas, with each other, with strangers, you're just trusting me. Like, I don't know why you're trusting me, but you are. Well, the only reason I, and I, I keep flipping, like I, I've looked at it and went back to it several times and now I can't find it, of course, but. Ah, I found it, I, so it's oh. page 85 in the original version. I, I would imagine it's relatively close in the second edition. So the Venn diagram, can we see a picture of it? Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Sarah, what, what picture is that? Or what page is that? You're on mute, sorry. I gotta, I gotta unmute, I'm not used to this. Um, 75 in it's the new book. So it's 85 in the second book. That's interesting, it's 10 pages off. We're gonna try not to be critical about that. Okay, so um, in the middle is we, and then me, us, and them are on the outside. Um, I think, if, if I remember correctly, kind of like what I was thinking about is that when you add up all of us groups and all of the me groups that are out there, when you add them all together, then you end up with like a collective we, right? So the, 
the us and them situation is just grammar. So team us are all the people that are on my side. But if we change the variable, I'm still on team us. But some of the people who had previously been on team us now could be on team them. Right. But to team them, I'm team them because their team them is team us. So none of this makes any sense. And so like ultimately, like I have a really good friend who's a super libertarian and like the it all boils down to like he is responsible for himself. And this is ultimately where we disagree on everything because I do not believe ultimately I am only responsible for myself. Um, I actually think that is a chicken shit way out of being responsible. And that a harder way of looking at responsibility is that I'm responsible for someone I will never meet. I will never be able to fix whatever I did wrong. And I'll never know if I did do anything wrong. And Julianne, you actually said a comment a couple of times ago that I felt really resonated with that. And I mean, part of the reason I think our friendship is so important to me is that if I can hold myself to the standard of being responsible for my behaviors, knowing that I will never actually know all of the impacts of my behaviors, then it will shape how I behave. And then to be myself some of the time, right? It'll shape my behaviors occasionally. And that is enough. It's not perfect. It's not always and forever, but it's enough. And that grace is what brings us to the last module which is what on earth are we going to do now? Blech. Spoiler alert, it's we're going to do the best we can with what we got some of the time, not 100% of the time because we have like shit to watch on Netflix. Right? Yes. Thank you very much for a great discussion number three. And I will see you on Friday, same time, same place. Thank you very much, y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.